Pie. And this precious creature is a baby broad-headed snake. I'm fascinated by venomous reptiles, and I've come here to Taronga Zoo in New South Wales to visit their firstborn baby broad-headed snake. This species used to be very common throughout its entire region, but it's now very rare. It's even endangered. And the reason for this, well, you only have to look across the bay. You can't say Sydney isn't beautiful, but it's built on rock known as Hawkesbury sandstone. And that's the habitat of the broad-headed snake. As the city has grown, the snake has become more and more rare. Broadheads haven't been found in Sydney since scientists began studying them around 30 years ago. The broadhead's territory is tiny, and that's the problem. It's only ever inhabited a few hundred square miles of New South Wales, almost all now buried under Sydney and the surrounding towns. But 100 miles south of Sydney lies the mountain wilderness of Morton National Park. It's here, on sandstone ridges hundreds of feet high, the scientists believe the broadhead has made its last stand. My quest is to find out if that's true and to fill in some of the gaps on the distribution map. With me, I've got the world expert on the broad-headed snake, Dr Jonathan Webb of Northern Territory University. So that's the uh, ridge we're going to go to, Mark. And, um, the exposed rock. Yeah. Really excited Jonathan is taking me to a ridge where he's been carrying out a study of snake populations. It's one of the few ridges you can actually drive to. But the journey to the top isn't for the faint-hearted. On the ridge tops, broadheads will hide for weeks waiting for prey under flat rocks that retain the sun's heat. If disturbed, they're highly aggressive. A bite could be extremely painful, though probably not fatal. I'm more likely to die looking for them on these dangerous ridges. There's some flat rocks down here, John. Yeah, a bit close to the edge for my liking. I don't think you'll get me down there. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I'm built for just this sort of thing, fitting into little gaps. All right, well, I'll watch you from up here if you don't mind. Well, I'll have to have somebody up here to pass the snakes up to if I catch them. I don't want to drop anything down there because it'll go on forever. Weathered slabs of sandstone or bush rock are the snake's hiding place. Uh, he's not under that. It's illegal to remove bush rock, but people do to build rock gardens. No. Any snakes? Not so far. No. Gotta get too excited down here, because if you found something and you jump for joy, you disappear over the edge. For eight years, Jonathan has inserted an electronic tag into every snake he's found on this ridge. By recapturing tagged snakes and comparing new data with his records, he can monitor population numbers and growth rates. No. Yeah! Small light. Gotta be careful with these fellas, aren't you? Yeah, they've killed a couple of people in Australia. It's an Australian small eyed snake, not a broadhead, and it packs quite a punch. They don't look like much, but they've got very powerful venom. I've tagged over 100 of these snakes in the last seven years, so I'll just give it a quick scan while well, you've got him there. Okay. Looks like a new animal. OK. Jonathan's been coming up here with his study of broad-headed snakes, and, of course, he meets a lot of small-eyed snakes as well. And all his snake rocks are numbered. And this small-eyed snake turned up under rock 191. It's a new snake. He hasn't met this one before. It's not tagged. So consequently, Jonathan can process it, get it into the programme, and then we'll put it back underneath rock 191. Oh, Nothing. Ants. No. Ants make life unbearable for snakes and lizards, so if you find them, you won't find much else. That's why I'm not keen on them. Oh, it's one of those flat spiders that jumps on you and bites you, yeah? These, these are quite wicked, aren't they? I wouldn't touch it. Some people are really affected by the venom and they just start to lose skin and flesh. Oh, yuck. Yuck. Nothing. I reckon we should go down to the uh, pet shop in Sydney, because that's where they might be. <laughs> 
I'm disappointed that uh, in such ideal conditions, in such a good study site, we haven't found uh, a broad-headed snake yet. I just hope that uh, they haven't been disturbed or removed. Last time he was here, Jonathan found 12 broad-headed snakes. He's convinced he knows what's happened. You can see this one's been broken. Someone's lifted it up and it's, it's broken. Who's likely to have done that? Probably amateur herptologists who are just looking for snakes or possibly looking for food to feed to their snakes. Well, the broad-headed snake is a, an endangered and protected species and it's illegal to collect them, isn't it? That's right. In fact, you're not even meant to be disturbing habitat in any national parks. So you need a permit to be able to do what we're doing. Which, of course, we do have. That's right. We can try climbing up this knoll up from here. Yeah. Might be a couple of rocks up there we could lift. That they haven't thought about. Yeah. Right. Let's get at it then. It looks as if Jonathan's right. The snake population on the main ridge may have been cleaned out by collectors. Oh, it's a long way down there. I'm hoping they decided against risking life and limb to climb this knoll. Oh, diamond python! Oh, oh hey. what a catch! <laughs> Go on, it's your snake. You found it. It's the python you find in this part of New South Wales. And that's a really nice capture, that. Wow. It was heading up. Jonathan saw it heading away, and he just it was just uncoiling, wasn't it? Yeah, just uncoiling. And that got, is he, beautiful. You got your tooth. Oh, he bit me, yeah, but so. It's only a point. <laughs> but it's a good-sized animal. Yeah. I'll record and photograph the python later, but finding it the moment we stepped onto the knoll has to be a good omen. So snakes are coming out? Yeah. Well, there's about three slabs here, but they're in the shade now, so... No. No. There's one rock over here I might turn. Go on, then. It's in the sun, so I could get lucky. Well, that's more promising than the ones I checked. Oh, ants. Ah. Another ants' nest. That's always a bad sign. Oh, broadhead! I've got oh. a broadhead! Oh, my God, I've got one! How about that? No, 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 my little friend. Well, there we are. Only a few feet from where we got the python. I don't believe it. How about that? This, this knoll was great. And it's one of your tag ones. I can see a tag in the side. Yeah. All right. I'll give him a scan. You can leave him in the bag. You're going to scan him in? Well. Yeah, you'll scan through the bag. There we go. Anyone finding this snake would realise that this is actually a snake from a research program and to remove snakes like that you couldn't do that ignorantly you would know you were taking study animals oh yeah. this is a good one I last caught this snake in uh, 1995 and at that stage he was 44.5 centimeters snout vent length and weighed 24.8 grams so when we uh, measure and weigh them later, we'll be able to see exactly how much it's grown in um, five years. Well, that's pretty well done. A diamond python three feet away from a broad-headed snake. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't come any better than that. It doesn't. It doesn't. That is a drop. Look at it. Oh, another broadhead. I glove it if you like. Go on, go on, go on. Got him. Got, got him. him. I got him. <laughs> I'm getting lucky. Uh. That's why you wear a glove. That's why I wear a glove. Ah! Well You're spotting those rocks. <laughs> I'm picking the rocks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Look at that flattening of the head. Threat posture. This is a snake under threat because it's only hanging on in this sort of a location. It's quite dangerous to get up to the point we're at now, and that is protection for the snake, because people think twice about maybe coming up here. Coming up. Scientific study of snakes can only proceed slowly. Jonathan and a handful of other scientists studying the species don't know how many broadheads still survive. Jonathan believes a broadhead colonies as yet unknown to science may exist on ridges so remote that no man has ever set foot there. I'm planning to find out if he's right. But before I do, I have a date with a much more deadly customer. 
It's not rare, and it's not threatened by man, but this creature threatens the people of Sydney every day. It's the Sydney funnel web, the world's deadliest spider, more deadly than the Black Widow. A funnel web bite can kill a child in a few hours. The only treatment is with antivenom, and the only way to make antivenom is from the spider's own venom, which is collected here at the Australian Reptile Park. I'm going to do something I've never done before in my life, and that's milk a venomous spider. And uh, I'm going to start, obviously, with the most venomous spider in the world. And the first thing you've got to do is annoy him. And then when he rears up, venom appears at the end of his fangs. I can pick it off with this pipette. I'm told if I touch him between the pedipalps, which are his male sex organs, and his front legs, it really gets him angry. I can quite understand that. Oh, and you can see the venom shining at the tips. It doesn't look very much, but assuredly enough to kill you. Male and female funnel webs both produce venom, but the male's venom is more deadly. As part of his life cycle, he must leave his web and go looking for a mate. And that's when he's likely to end up in your bedroom. To the west of Sydney lie the Blue Mountains. The funnel webs found here are a separate species, and it's not known if their venom differs from that of the Sydney funnel web. The Australian Reptile Park has asked me to catch a large Blue Mountain funnel web so they can analyse its venom. To give me a sporting chance, they've sent along spider expert Ros Whitten. Well, I hope so. It seems to be a good area. Well, this is a very heavy log, mm. Mark, but this is very this is ideal for funnel web spider habitat. We are not going to move this. <sighs> Probably no, not. not. No the two way of us. are we going to move that. We could try. <laughs> you try. <laughs> Up to now, there have been no recorded deaths from Blue Mountain funnel web bites. But more and more people are coming to live here. If someone is bitten, it's vital the antivenom used to treat them is effective. That's where Roz and I come in, always assuming we can find some spiders. We found an area under some rocks where the, we found a number of um, what we think are funnel web spider webs. There's the spider. What? There it is. Oh, it's the female. What they really want are males, because of course they're supposed to be more toxic. So if you think it's ugly looking at it with two eyes, what do you think it thinks of you looking back with eight? <laughs> Mark! Mark, where are you? The jungle. There. Just watch where I'm stepping. Not a thing. I think this Blue Mountain funnel web is uh, either very rare or fictional. Um, this is supposed to be perfect habitat, and I thought I found a small one earlier, but that was it. And we've looked under, well, I don't know how many rogs and locks for no, no results. Rogs and locks. Um, that's why I'm going wrong. I'm looking under rogs and locks. At last, our luck changes. Ros and I find ourselves in an ancient area of primary rainforest. Here, strange and interesting creatures have existed undisturbed, perhaps for millions of years. This is a funnel web colony, and these spiders are old and very big. Look at that. There's the fang. I mean, this must be an absolutely immense female. Very big female. I mean, the nest is impressive, but when you see this outside, she shed her skin because this was too small. She's bigger than this now. It's not whole. You want to put your finger down. It just doesn't seem right to disturb this old girl. She's lived here 20-odd years, maybe. So we're thinking of leaving her and trying to find a smaller animal, which is going to be easier to collect, and uh, leave her in peace. <sighs> we've got a beautiful one. Oh, it's immense. OK, now what we've got to do care. is we've got to make sure... That's I want to see where our head is. Oh, she's there. We don't no, want her to no. take off. No, 
Take care, because that is an absolute mega she's spider. She's absolutely beautiful. My God. She's beautiful oh, she, and she's big. You can barely get her in the jar. She's beautiful. Quick, oh. Okay, it's all right. Oh, look at the size of that. Good God, if I knew <sighs> it was going to be that big, I wouldn't have been kneeling on the ground. <laughs> Are you pleased with that? Very, very pleased. She's when, when, beautiful. When's your birthday? 18th of February. Well, this is my <laughs> late birthday present to you. Oh, thank you. Now that we've got a blue mountain funnel web spider, and she's going to be regularly producing venom to save human lives. She won't be harmed. She'll be giving venom quite voluntarily. And look at the size of her. I think she's probably got quite a bit to give. Does this highly endangered snake still survive on these lost world ridges to the south of Sydney? Jonathan Webb and I plan to find out. Almost certainly the first human beings ever to go there. It's only a small outcrop, but I'd, I'd say there'd be one or two snakes there. Look at those crevices. Do you reckon there's enough there to support a population of broad-headed snakes? I'll know when we get a bit closer. Yeah, it looks excellent, but I don't know that you could land there. Step out the chopper, you step out the edge. Yeah, I haven't told you that um, I'm not really fond of flying, have I, Mark? A bit late now. You can believe no one's been here. There are no roads or tracks, and the only way in is by helicopter. I don't know if we'll get this thing down on this cliff edge. Oh, dear. And even that's dangerous. The edge is just totally undercut, too, Mark. Roger that. We'll get that away. chance of landing up on the other side of the trees. I think I saw a flat area in there. Where to start? Yeah, gee, this looks fantastic, doesn't it? There's loads of suitable habitat. And hopefully no disturbance on this outcrop. Well, I would think we're the first people to ever come up here. Ah, oh, that's just come on. magnificent. Let's get started. Let's find some rocks. All right, let's submit. Let's start with these. The ants got here before us. Uh, nothing. There is no doubt that this is ideal habitat, and it's impossible to imagine that anyone has ever been here looking for snakes. We should have come looking for ants. But as we turn more and more rocks, the shocking truth begins to hit home. There are no broad-headed snakes here. I can't imagine why not. Perhaps it's just this ridge, and we will be going to another. But for Jonathan, it's a shock. In fact, I hardly know what to say to cheer him up. This is um, much more well, it's difficult, difficult to get to. I just think that they've never made it here. Yeah. Hmm? It's disappointing. I know, it's disappointing. Come all this way. The helicopter trips have been really valuable in terms of getting to some of these remote locations, finding out that the habitat's suitable, but the broad-headed snakes aren't there. So that'll be a great help to me when I come to write my report to national parks. I'll suggest we need to think about ways to prevent access to the sites where the snakes are still found. A second Lost World Ridge, and Jonathan is hoping for a change in our luck. But a precarious search produces the same baffling result. No broadheads, in fact, no snakes at all. Were there ever snakes here? If there were, what's happened to them? It could be that the snakes were there and have been wiped out by a bushfire that's come through. The snakes don't disperse very far. So once you have a local extinction on one of these isolated ridge tops, it's very unlikely that the snakes can get back there by their own means. I came to help Jonathan fill in gaps on the distribution map for the broad-headed snake. We've done that, and what we've discovered suggests the snakes are even more endangered than scientists had previously thought. That means that the few broadheads that are managing to hang on are even more important. 
We can't afford to lose a single creature from this ravaged world of ours. And we certainly can't allow this gorgeous snake to become no more than a memory. Future generations will not forgive us if we let the broad-headed snake disappear into history. There's a very sad ending to this story. Shortly after filming was completed, the Australian Reptile Park burned to the ground in a massive fire. Over 500 reptiles and all the spiders in the anti-venom production program died. However, there is an upside. The Australian Reptile Park plans to resurrect itself and venom production will continue. Now we